The African youth, studying hard to reach a common goal, be work ready. According to the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, almost half of the world's youth will be African by 2100 and the continent's working age population will grow by 70%. In the latest Education at a Glance 2019 report done by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the number of students pursuing tertiary education globally has grown continuously over the past two decades. The need to invest in developing youth with skills and create employment opportunities is of importance. Et donc, Il faut suivre cette évolution. Le nombre de diplômés a beaucoup augmenté, ce qui fait que la qualité a baissé. Et donc, au niveau économique, les opérateurs économiques posent le problème de la qualité du système éducatif. Quelles sont les compétences requises pour que les étudiants puissent être intégrés sur le marché du travail de façon adéquate Ça, c'est l'équation du, 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 du système universitaire des pays africains. Comment faire en sorte que on peut développer l'infrastructure, le gouvernement développe l'infrastructure, comment faire en sorte que d'assurer la qualité de la formation pour qu'ils puissent être intégrés dans le marché du travail et donc comment faire en sorte que les entreprises profitent de, de ces aptitudes, des qualités qui vont être euh, euh, demandées par l'entreprise. Preparing youth with 21st century skills is important in order to keep up with the demand in the labour market. The risk of unemployment, job insecurity due to low paid or temporary contracts and the uncertainty associated with starting to live independently can make this a challenging phase in young people's lives. Education therefore remains a key player. The transition from education to work can be a difficult period for many young people. Understanding the future of employment and adapting education to give students a chance of employability is one way to address these concerns. Dans les pays africains aujourd'hui, nous vivons un paradoxe. Le paradoxe c'est le chômage de diplômés d'une part Il y a beaucoup de diplômés de l'enseignement supérieur qui sont en chômage et il y a un, un manque de, 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 de compétences moyennes ou basses. Il y a un manque de, de travailleurs qui ont une qualification moyenne. Et donc euh, euh, l'économie se retrouve avec un, des chômeurs d'enseignement supérieur qui sont incapables de se d'aller vers les, 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 le travail, les offres d'emploi qui existent dans le pays. Et de l'autre côté. Euh, nous manquons de, 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 de travailleurs dans les secteurs de la plomberie, dans le secteur de la menuiserie, dans le secteur de l'agriculture, dans le secteur même dans l'industrie. L'industrie africaine n'est pas une industrie euh, robotisée, n'est pas une industrie très développée, et donc les besoins. Ce qui fait qu'il faut que euh, dans la stratégie d'éducation éviter que l'on soit dans cette situation euh, qui est un paradoxe chômage et diplômé de l'enseignement supérieur, pénurie de travailleurs. C'est le cas tunisien. Nous avons aujourd'hui en Tunisie 30%, le taux de chômage des diplômés de l'enseignement supérieur en Tunisie est de 30%. La moyenne du taux de chômage, c'est 15%. In Africa, we have all the same challenges. Either South Africa or Morocco or Egypt or, or other African countries, which is, first of all, we have uh, uh, to um, reduce the gap that we have with other continents and other countries in terms of technologies, development and innovation. Second one, which is the most important, is how to uh, mutualize and uh, synergize our efforts uh, according to the investment in innovation within the universities and the schools because none of our universities or schools have the critical size to develop by themselves the laboratories or the innovation budget or the competencies even uh, for the expertise to develop innovation. So the, on, the only one and the unique way to do it is to mutualize our effort either in one country or even multi-countries to uh, make sure that those uh, budgets, those laboratories and those expertise are gathered for the development of the innovation in Africa. Um, no longer am I looking for a lengthy CV with lots of experiences and lots of qualifications. I'm looking for the softer skills. I'm looking for people who have learning agility. 
Today, students need a learning institution that can help develop them to meet current and future demands of the labor market. Honoris United Universities, a pan-Africa organization that is present in 10 countries and with a network count of 11 institutions, is one of such private education institutes that created an ecosystem to develop and educate students for 21st century skills. We have a program offer, health sciences, engineering, law, business, that is robust uh, and it's pan-African in nature. So the, one of the competitive features that you will have in terms of creating access is a program offer. The outcome on that is a pan-African profile and a pan-African view. The second piece then if you look at how is Honoris creating access uh, in the portfolio has to do with the execution of the customer. So we have high school leavers, we have working adults, and so therefore we provide an offer to different segments of the society. The third piece of that is in the use of technology. What does it mean to be in the future, uh, in the world of work? If the university is going to be traditional and just campus-based, you are not creating further access. What you're creating is a destination. The use of technology for us is going to create more access. And we're going to be thoughtful about how we introduce that because, in fact, technology is an enabler, it's not a solution. And in education, that's the way I want to view it. How do we use the technology to enable better access at a good quality level? Tunisia, the same challenges in South Africa with a growing middle class, with a demand for a quality education, with limited resources from public education, and, you know, and, and, and the need for an institutional private, uh, private offer. So it, it's a common problem, and we exchange a lot. We have an academic council that exists today, that unites all of the academics from the different countries and that exchange best practice, that work also on curriculums and mainly on the soft skills because the gap is the same, is the same everywhere. But uh, the platform offers much more than, uh, than that and also in developing soft skills certificates, you know, we have the economies of scale to do it across all of Africa and not only for Morocco. We've got this massive demographic dividend, as it is called, the youth bulge of Africa. And education, training and skills is central to their success as Africa rises. We must understand that work-integrated learning plays a central role in all our qualifications. And in so far as our qualifications are concerned, I would like to call them what I term the reflective practitioner. Students that enter university to reflect on their practice. We should try and move away from the traditional concept of universities, uh, of which 65% of our students are in and 35% are in distance learning. If you move more students towards distance learning, they would also have the opportunity of participating in work integrated learning. And for me, that is the biggest and most serious challenge that we have, especially on the African continent. Digitization, automation and technological advances are changing the nature of work globally. These trends will increase the pace of change, raising the premium on skills that help young people be adaptable. The education sector needs to keep up with these trends. According to International Institute for Water and Environmental Engineering 2013, most African countries face shortages of human resources and capacity within science, technology, engineering and mathematics, as well as agriculture and health disciplines. Education that impacts societies has to be diverse. You need a good offer of public and you need a good offer of private. And in that offer of public and private, you also need diversity in the execution. Sometimes it's a four-year degree, sometimes it's a two-year degree, sometimes it's short courses. So I believe that the role of private in creating diversity and therefore success in nation building is critical. If we were to just step back from the skills that are required and look at what's happening in the macro environment, we've got new technologies, digital technologies, AI, robotics, the internet of things, big data, cloud computing. And what this is doing basically is creating a whole range of new jobs for young people. So what we need is young people to have all of the new skills for them to thrive and succeed in this global creative economy. We, what we are looking at is an environment where anything is possible but nothing is certain. So we need to have graduates that are prepared for any eventuality. Graduates that have agile mindsets, that can work anywhere, anytime, that can quick, quickly pick up opportunities and run with them. 
in order for us to produce competitive and valuable educational solutions, we require a very multidisciplinary and diverse educational input. En fait, la stratégie innovante du laboratoire, c'est spécialement pour l'ingénierie. L'IMSI est euh, en fait aujourd'hui euh, numéro un en formation d'ingénierie au Maroc. Qui dit la formation, dit des réalisations des projets, la préparation d'une génération future en IT, en, euh, en, en, en transmission, en automatique, en génie industriel, en génie civil, et, mais aussi en audit et finance. Donc le laboratoire, il est là a pour objectif de préparer cette génération et, et, et rendre ce système innovant en collaboration avec nos industriels. C'est-à-dire, euh, on prend les besoins de l'industrie, on travaille sur ces besoins, on a une stratégie qui est généralement future et une veille technologique sur ce qui se passe au monde pour qu'on puisse booster notre formation et avoir un impact direct sur nos étudiants en termes d'une stratégie innovante. A worldwide pandemic such as COVID-19 showed the potential need for skills in the health sector. Training systems can help address needs for healthcare workers, those engaged in producing relevant medical equipment, or those who provide essential childcare and elder care services. Ilihem Mistiri, MD of Upsat Group in Tunisia, explains why Africa needs to review its strategy for teaching medicine. Africa needs to change the way in teaching medicines and healthcare and even engineering because it needs to put the bar on the international standards. In medicine, for example, uh, uh, and healthcare, we, uh, we are offering to our students the medical, the Honoris Medical, medical Simulation Center in Tunisia. This is a new pedagogical concept that is, uh, which is putting the, uh, the student in the heart of its learning. The st student in the uh, uh, Honoris Simulation Center is uh, actively participating to his own uh, training and learning. And uh, this is strengthening his, um, um, uh, the foundation of his um, uh, diploma. Honoris Simulation Center is a, a world-class institution. We are offering to our students uh, the real-life experience on uh, a high-fidelity mannequin uh, before uh, letting them uh, touching patients. It's very important because world is changing and ethics is changing and we have to learn to our students the importance of uh, taking in charge uh, and, and how to communicate with their patients. First of all, uh, simulation education is a new method uh, in the world. And uh, this center is the equivalent of many centers in the world. Europe, US, and that's uh, why we want to use this new method which provide Health caregiver or student more efficient, more efficient when they have to perform uh, something, uh, anything you, you can imagine, we can do for patient, and of course the final result to improve. I repeat, to improve the quality of uh, health we provide to patient to African in, in this case because we are in Africa. Believing that students need to be trained and equipped to compete globally, Dr. Dilo Dogo from the College of Health Sciences at the Nile University, Abuja, states that internationally recognized standards in medicine should be prioritized. Medicine is an international language. There is no medicine for Africa, there is no medicine for Europe, there is no medicine for, Africa, for America. Medicine is medicine, therefore the preparation of students across the continent has to approximate to what medical students and medical graduates should be across the world at large. Here at Nile University, we put in place a structure that will be responsive to those needs to ensure that we have adequate facilities, world-class teachers, world-class amenities to ensure that our students get nothing but the best and become marketable across the African continent and indeed the world. Currently, even across the Nigerian nation, 
we are conscious of the fact that most of our doctors end up in Europe and in America. What we are trying to do here is perhaps something more superior to what is existing currently. And with honorees coming into play, we'll have a kind of support services across other countries. We'll share experiences between students and staff and build world-class structure and infrastructure that will grant our students nothing but the best. Ensuring that Africa's young people secure employment or can create their own livelihoods is arguably the single most significant task facing African policymakers today. Sharing of experiences and hands-on training methodologies are key practices shared amongst the Honoris Network. There are five pillars on which the Honoris United University's Pan-African Higher Education Network uh, operates. Now, in so far as education for impact, what we are really talking about is education not for the sake of education. Education that will make a change in people's lives. Education that will provide them with opportunity. Education that will give them employability. Education that will open their minds and begin to think as individuals, critical individuals in broader society. We must stop training individuals at universities and higher education institutions simply to seek jobs. They need to be taught to be entrepreneurs. And being an entrepreneur would mean that they become job providers rather than job seekers. And the sooner we do that, the better for society as a whole. Aujourd'hui, um, la, la, la demande des recruteurs est, est un peu différente de ce qu'on avait, nous, l'habitude de rencontrer lorsqu'on a eu nos diplômes. Euh, le monde évolue, le monde change. Donc, euh, les recruteurs, ils n'ont plus la patience aujourd'hui euh, d'entraîner de, euh, ou euh, de faire des plans d'intégration euh, de longue durée pour les nouveaux recrues. Donc, euh, les étudiants, ils ont euh, intérêt à tout apprendre à l'école, à l'université, avant d'avoir le diplôme. À la fin de leur parcours de à peu près 300 heures entre travail fictif et atelier de formation, on prépare nos apprenants à vraiment affronter le marché d'emploi avec un bon CV, des lettres de motivation, comment est-ce qu'il va chercher cet emploi. Donc notre objectif, c'est vraiment de former nos apprenants à trouver eux-mêmes leur emploi et avoir tous les acquis techniques et en compétences sociales pour affronter le monde de travail externe après leur diplôme. The hallmark of TVET, its focus on practical skills and work readiness, makes remote learning challenging. TVET programs that struggle most with adjustment to distance learning are those that depend heavily on learning by doing. In contrast, programs that can switch to remote learning more easily are those with a stronger emphasis on academic subjects or on work-specific skills that do not require manual activities. But is this approach possible? Employer actually, like Microsoft or other big company, is looking today. It's uh, different from the old world. They, they are looking for employees that are more skilled in the soft skills, not only in the technical or high high education skills. And today, uh, the soft skills uh, is gain a big part on the on the process on the, on the hiring process. Uh, even in the Microsoft, we called talent today, and all the employees called hiring talent, not only hired people. Africa has got a fantastic young population. There cannot possibly be a scarcity. It's an abundance of talent. And um, we need to say, how do we tap into the talent? But in order to tap into the talent, you have to invest in the talent and you have to invest early on. I think the, our reading into the predictions of the, the way the labor market is changing of the 21st century suggests to us that uh, there's definitely going to be a change in the way employees understand talent and talent management. Um, employees are no more looking for people and talent that just have expertise in a particular area, but those employee, employees who can apply themselves into different contexts. And the graduates that we produce are able to apply themselves in rapidly changing environments. 
But beyond that, employees are also seeking to find talent who are able to apply uh, key critical skills, which we call soft skills, in the workplace. And these skills we believe to be beyond the complementary uh, skills of the profession or vocation. The responsibility to innovate education does not solely rest on the shoulders of education institutions. Collaboration between private and public sector plays a crucial role in the development of education. I'm coming from the business, I'm coming from the big company like Microsoft, and what is preparing, we are talking about intelligence, artificial intelligence, we are talking about machine learning, we are talking about quantum computing, we are talking about something very amazing and we need, and it's our role also, to bring this kind of information, this kind of needed skills to institute and help MC also to prepare uh, the future of engineering. And I think this is something that all corporates need to grapple with um, and we need to play a role in this. You know, academic institutions can do only so much to prepare students for the world of work. Uh, and they play a very important role because the content that they teach uh, is based on sound research and so forth. But, you know, um, whilst they actually are going through their education, they need to partner with corporates to get the experiences um, that they will need to get into the workplace. Innovating education to be adaptable to the labour market is of importance to secure a better future for Africa's youth. Honoris United University's network and offerings is but one way to address the demand from our future workforce. I think we really have this tremendous benefit of a Pan-African network of universities across Africa at Honoris United Universities. And this creates some interesting opportunities for collaborative intelligence. We have students and faculty that are able to work cross-continentally and are able to work across different geographies and clearly they're very different. Faculty in South Africa or Southern Africa working with faculty in North Africa. We have students in South Africa on student exchange programs in North Africa. And perhaps the one key issue in our collaborative intelligence at Honoris is about making sure that our students really get their cultural awareness right. We, we have come up with a, cup, a number of labs, collaborative labs, where we are teaching our students entrepreneurship. We have the lab um, here in uh, Regent Business School in South Africa. We have the Smarty Lab in Morocco. We have um, simulations in, um, in Tunisia. And even more recently, we are conceptualizing the iTeach Lab in South Africa in Mancosa. So entrepreneurship is really at the heart of the skills that we are trying to teach our students because we know that that is exactly what they are going to need going forward. L'Afrique elle est prête aujourd'hui pour on va dire créer des opportunités mais aussi pour offrir des opportunités à ces jeunes. Donc oui, la réponse est oui, l'Afrique est prête pour pour qu'on puisse appliquer les nouvelles méthodes d'enseignement pour qu'on puisse euh, enseigner donc euh, ces nouvelles compétences euh, demandées par le marché de l'emploi euh, et donc ça va aider beaucoup euh, ça va être comme un raccourci euh, dans le développement du, du continent when we think about partnerships or we think about the, the, the notion of partnerships I start with how it is that the academic leadership or the administrative leadership in Morocco can communicate and co collaborate with the South Africans because that's what's going to create robust solutions. We have all the intellectual capacity inside. Once we get that going, then we go to the outside. And there could be relationships that are regional, pan-regional or international, whether you're talking about a Unilever who's looking at Africa in, in a view and we want to connect to the Unilever for employability, or whether it's in the academic sense, where we have relationships in Morocco and Tunisia with French and UK institutions for the academic component. So I look at partnerships both in the inside, because of the complexity of the project, we need to have ease of conversation, the same vocabulary, the same mission, and then on the outside, there's academic collaborations for the student to be able to have that experience, but also the employability side, where we need to have the connectivity to the ecosystem.